Uh, so moving on to our next presentation, which will be by Dr. Drew Farqua, who's one of our star infectious disease advanced trainees here at the uh, Princess Alexandra Hospital. One of his um, colleagues and one of our other fantastic ATs, Dr. Hannah Grimson, was originally going to present and prepared most of the material, lucky Drew, uh, but was unfortunately unable to be here today. Thanks, Drew, for stepping in at short notice uh, to do today's case presentation, um, a case that we've managed here and that you're very familiar with. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as uh, Lana has said, unfortunately, um, Dr. Hannah Grimson uh, couldn't, uh, sadly couldn't be here today. So unfortunately for you all, you're stuck having to listen to me instead. Uh, I can only apologise. Um, we were just about to, we just wanted to, our talk today was just going through a quick case presentation. We had a recent case here at PA Hospital. Um, so this was of a 55-year-old uh, female who had a background of end-stage liver disease, secondary to vanishing bile duct syndrome from fluke cloxacillin usage. She underwent a liver transplant in May of 2023, um, which was complicated by some early um, post-transplant issues, including ascites, CMV, and cholangitis. And she was initially referred to the infectious diseases team following the identification of granulomatous inflammation on a liver biopsy performed in November of last year um, in the setting of persistent LFT derangement uh, post her transplantation. Uh, looking into her background a bit more, she had a relatively unremarkable past medical history and was on typical medications inclusive of, inclusive of tacrolimus and mycophenolate. Um, aside from the aforementioned um, flucloxacillin, she had no other adverse drug reactions. From a social history perspective, she was born in Australia and lived on a rural property with her husband and two children. She worked in a rural um, hospital and otherwise had a relatively unremarkable exposure history. Uh, investigations at the time of her biopsy in November indicated uh, CKD stage 3A, a mixed um, LFT derangement, as you can see in the middle, and an unremarkable FBC. Uh, the table at the bottom is just a trend of her liver enzymes, which on the left starts at the date of her transplantation to the right um, on the date of her biopsy, which just shows this persistent liver enzyme derangement. Um, further workup of this uh, liver enzyme derangement included um, multiple modalities of imaging, including CT, MRCP, and an ultrasound, which was all unremarkable. So then delving into this um, biopsy, which was just histopathology only, indicated lobular inflammatory changes, including granuloma formation. Notably, there were no features of rejection and no fungal elements or AFB, and immunohistochemistry for CMV was negative. A targeted, a targeted exposure history at the time revealed significant farming exposure, including sheep and cattle, alongside animal exposures to other dogs, kangaroos, emu, and rabbits. Um, she was vaccinated for Q fever. She didn't hunt any wild animal, animals, and there was no real tick exposure of note. Subsequent to this, she went, um, underwent further serological testing for your typical granulomatous infections, and a paraffin-embedded tissue from the liver biopsy was extracted, and it was sent down to ICPMR at Westmead for pan mycobacterial PCR. Um, unfortunately, all of these um, investigations were unremarkable, um, and the, I guess the workup stagnated um, slightly until there was an unexpected update um, in February of this year, which um, the uh, liver transplant team kindly informed us that they were notified by Donate Life that the recipient of the lung transplant um, from the same donor was diagnosed with pulmonary TB on routine surveillance bronchoscopy. Um, this is on a gene expert MTB PCR, which was uh, low positive, of which uh, rifampicin resistance was not detected. Her cultures were still pending at the time, and this was also sent off for XDR assay. The recipient um, of the lung transplant had no significant TB exposures. And so the opinion of the lung transplant team at the time was they had a high index suspicion for a donor-derived infection and therefore notified the transplant coordinators. On exploration of further donor details, uh, they were from a highly endemic region in Southeast Asia and donor screening at the time identified an indeterminate quantifier on gold, urine and sputum, which was AFB smear and culture negative and an unremarkable chest X-ray. With respect to our patients subsequent to this, we added on a gene expert PCR, which was not detected. And on review of patient over the phone, she was really asymptomatic, no features of active pulmonary disease and constitutionally well. So the plan was to proceed with the repeat liver biopsy in February this year. So I guess the question at this time was to treat or not to treat. 
Usually I'd linger on this slide for dramatic effect, but due to time, I'll, I'll crack on. And I guess that's what we did. We cracked on with empirical treatment. This was in coordination with the um, pharmacist and the transplant team and consists of your typical regimen of rifampicin, nicinizid, pyrocinamide, and ethambutol. Um, the repeat biopsy was somewhat unsatisfying, you would say. Um, histopathology showed no discrete granulomas and some borderline uh, T-cell mediated rejection. There was no histiocytic aggregates, although there was some uh, commented prominent portal vein inflammation, of which there are case reports of this aforementioned uh, inflammation in TB cases. The gene expert PCR was not detected and the AFB smear and mycobacterial cultures were negative. Uh, around this time too, the lung recipient cultures had returned um, positive with pan-susceptible results. And in discussion in departmental and mycobacterial meetings and in collaboration with the patient, the decision was to continue on with treatment at this stage. So I just want to briefly touch upon donor-derived TB, which accounts for less than 5% of the active TB cases. And of this active TB in the transplant population, it's usually from a reactivation of um, latent TB rather than donor-derived infection. And the estimated frequency is roughly relatively 20 to 75% greater than that of the general population. Notably, about a third to a half of these cases post-transplantation um, are disseminated or extrapulmonary, which uh, in comparison to the general population is about 15%. A recent uh, review by Abad et al. retrieved 36 cases of donor-derived TB, 17 proven, uh, eight were probable and 11 possible, of which the main results indicated a mean time to presentation or symptom onset of about 2.7 months, of which fever was the most um, likely presenting symptom. Graph loss in this um, population was 20% and all-cause mortality was 25%, of which half of these were attributable um, to TB itself. And they did comment the main strategy for minimizing risk is obviously identifying high-risk donors. And this leads me to the TSANZ guidelines, which comments on the reasonable efforts should be made to rule out active tuberculosis in the, diagnose, in the donors. And it does have a recommendation for diagnostic testing with microscopy or PCR when suspected infections based on both epidemiological and clinical characteristics. But this does obviously acknowledge the difficulty in screening in terms of turnaround time. Um, and interpretation. It does all comment on, comment on the uh, consideration of donors with previously treated or active latent TB, but does not, does not recommend uh, consideration of donors with current positive tests or current active treatment. Uh, Hannah put in this lovely diagram about the multidisciplinary team and you know, involved in the management of these patients. But what I thought the main, one of my main takeaways was the importance of the interpersonal, I guess, interdepartmental communication, um, which I think led to best patient care. Without the identification by the lung transplant team, communication with the transplant coordinators, communication to the liver team and then to the ID team, I really don't see that appropriate or succinct flow of information that enabled this you know, good outcome for the patient. So just finishing up on where we are now, our patient is currently tolerating her therapy without issue. She's completed two months of HRZ and plans to continue on a further 10 months um, of isoniazid and rifampicin. Her LFTs have improved um, without treatment, which is good. And just as an aside, we've also seen uh, the kidney transplant recipient um, from the donor who's also just been started on some isoniazid prophylaxis after negative screening. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you for summarising the case, Drew. Um, we might take just a couple of minutes for um, audience questions or comments regarding the case. Thanks for the really interesting case. I guess I have two questions. The first, um, the donor donated lungs as well, so I'm wondering whether they had a CT test and a BAL prior to donation. And the second question was about whether you did an IGRA in your liver transplant recipient at the time that you had the liver findings. Yeah, so the, the donor didn't have a CT or a BAL. Um, just it was the chest X-ray that they had, which was which was unremarkable. Um, in, and sputum cultures as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah had sputum and urine cultures mm. uh, was smear and culture negative. Um, and the IGRA in uh, our recipient was indeterminate at the time because of a poor mitogen response. Yeah. What would you have done, Tina? Yeah, I think the you know, the patient was pretty happy with that decision too. 
unfortunately is tolerating the treatment well, which always makes it easier. Any other questions from the audience or comments? So I think that case segues very nicely into um, our final presentation for this session.